Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 7th of April. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, Britain has got its way in Syria. And don't get buyer's remorse. Fight for Glass-Steagall banking separation. So, first, Britain has got its way in Syria. Craig will make a confession to the viewers. This is the first episode ever of this show that we've had to reshoot. We, we had just put it to bed and the news came through that Donald Trump has launched a Tomahawk missile attack on a military, um, an, an airfield, a Syrian government airfield in Syria, in response to the claims of a, uh, that the Syrian government committed a chemical weapons attack on, on civilians um, earlier in the week. So this is a dramatic development in global politics, and it's a dramatic break from Trump's own policies. Yeah, Robbie, he's now basically re-established himself as the, he's saying, I am now going to become the global policeman for any sort of injustice in the world. Now, he hasn't gone as far as to say we're going to continue the policy of regime change and so forth, which is the policy of Obama and Clinton and so forth, but he's now taken a giant step in the direction of saying that we are allowed to go in and intervene on the sovereignty of another nation. And, OK, yeah, look, the, the, the terrible atrocities that was shown, you know, are uh, absolutely you know, disgusting and beyond belief that anyone could do that. But it's not been established that That's this right. was your start government, anything but that. In well, fact, there is so much doubt about it that this has created a real problem for Trump because if he's gone on the basis of lies, which is more than likely the case for the evidence yeah. that we have, then he's basically shown that he's been either manipulated or... You know, he, he's well. Basically, well, what it does show is the guy can't be trusted, and that's a big deal in world politics. Well, we're going to, and, and well, and he's he's. Um, it is a big deal, but I will say to temper that, um, and for the viewers' benefit, there's a there's a variety of opinions circulating even in our office about this. But it, but it, I, I will say that um, at worst, he's just continuing the American the tradition that has been well and truly established. What is what? What was surprising about Trump as a candidate is he is that on this particular issue, he ran on the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So to to align with that, now he he relies on intelligence, and he has been um, someone's got a hold of him. The the intelligence apparatus that have been un, that his that 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 have been attacking him up until now got a hold of him and convinced him that this chemical attack was perpetrated by Assad, and he has responded in a way that he attacked Obama for being weak, for not responding to, so he's shown he's tough. Now, there is a scenario, this has just happened, so by the time viewers are watching this, Craig, there, there yeah, will have been more. a lot of developments. There is a scenario where Trump has chosen the, the least, um, the, 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 the minimal response path, right? Um, apparently he gave the Russians notice, we're gonna do this, get out, make sure you don't have anyone in the way, bang and hit this airfield, the minimal response path. Um, and maybe that's a deliberate strategy. Um, the other scenario is Trump and the, peop the people around Trump have, co have convinced him that if you're going to get anywhere in domestic policy in the United States, you have to get these war hawks in the Congress and the Republican Party and the Democrats on side, and you're going to have to do something like this on the international sphere, right? And that is a terrible scenario, but that's, that's possible as well. We'll see. Well, see, that's the trouble, Robbie. These deals within deals mean that you, you've got people guessing as to what Trump was doing. Now, prior to this, look, a week ago, he was very clear. I want to go back to the American system. Economically, that meant dumping free trade, going against free trade. He's been consistently going in that direction. He's had a long history of saying we've got no role within Syria whatsoever, right? But those are the two things that have brought that have got he earned him the enmity of the establishment. That's the point. So in order to be able to bring him down on those fronts, right, you have to attack him on where he where he's actually vulnerable. And he has made a lot of war hawkish type statements in the past and making America great again. We're not going to be bullied. We're going to you know stand up in the world and so on and so weak. forth. We're not going to look weak. So that's actually in a vulnerability, which is actually, I mean, he was actually having dinner when these strikes occurred with the Chinese president. And we have to wait and see what comes out of that as far as the Chinese are concerned, because it was the Chinese and the Russians that were standing up in the United Nations in unprecedented ways, particularly for the Chinese, saying, you cannot abuse the power of the United Nations by accusing yeah. the Assad government of something that did not happen. 
And I think what people may miss here, Robbie, is the actual details of what actually did yeah. take place, which has been, as look, look, go back to 2013, right, where the Assad government was accused of chemical attacks on, on people at that point. Several months later, the United Nations came out and actually said the Assad government didn't do that. But that was not reported globally and widespread in the widespread and press. So when this attack came up this week, politicians like Theresa May, etc., all referred back to that 2013 attack as if this is Assad doing what he did in 2013 and ignoring the fact that UN envoy Carla Del Ponte had said Assad didn't do it. Yeah. So, I mean, Trump's now putting himself in a position which is completely well, and that's changed. So let's go through the global. details, Craig. Um, that what, you, what the viewer is supposed to believe, that here's Assad, the president of Syria, he's, he has survived six years of a war that's that backed by the West to oust him. He survived that. Not only has he survived it, he has been winning in the last 12 months with Russia's support. Not only that, just in the last few days or, or few weeks, the, the US government, the, the new Trump administration had announced that US policy was no longer regime change in Syria, right? And so everything was going Assad's way. <laughs> and therefore, he decided to do the one thing guaranteed to unite the world against him and get bombs dropped on him by deliberately committing a chemical weapons attack against innocent civilians, including women and children. That's mm -hmm. what you're supposed to believe, right? And because for six years, people like John McCain, the same guy who whipped up the Iraq war and whipped up the Libya war, all based on lies, people like John McCain and Hillary Clinton, they call Assad a butcher, then um, the claims just have to be accepted, case closed, that's Assad. Now, that's all garbage. And what we, we're going to do is play some... Um, I want to play a video at the moment of a congressman named Thomas Massey, a Republican Party congressman. What's extraordinary about this video by Thomas Massey, this, this, this is him being interviewed on CNN yesterday. Now, at the time of the weapons of mass destruction claims, for instance, against Iraq, no congressman went out in a limb and said, that's rubbish, right? Some of them might have said, oh, I'd like to see more evidence. But none of them said, you know, that like, there was just, you just didn't doubt it, you know? Um, lots, a lot has changed since then. So this guy, Thomas Mathis, Ma, uh, Massey, actually doubts this publicly. And before I play the video, here's something else about Thomas Massey which explains why he probably doubts it. Last July, um, Obama, under enormous pressure, finally released the 28 pages, hold that up please, of the, of the US Joint Congressional Report into 9-11 mm. that had been suppressed for, by Bush and Cheney and then Obama for 14 years. Because those pages name the Saudis as the Saudi royals as funding Al Qaeda to commit 9/11, mm. right? And the, the royal they named Prince Bando is a good friend of George Bush and Prince Charles, and that's why they were suppressed for 14 years. Thomas Massey was one of the few congressmen to go and read those pages before they were released and comment on them. He couldn't say what was in them, but he said, "This is what he said at the time." He said, "I had to stop every couple of pages and try to rearrange my understanding of history." It challenges you to rethink everything. Now, that's what, so now you've got a guy who's had his eyes opened about how the world really works, and this is what he said on CNN yesterday about the chemical weapons attack. It's hard to know exactly what's happening in Syria right now. I'd like to know specifically how that release of, of chemical gas, if it, uh, if it did occur, and it looks like it did, how that occurred. Because, I don't, frankly, I don't think Assad would have done that. It does not serve his interests. It would tend to draw us into that civil war even further. Who, and who, so, do, you think, who do you think is behind it? You think you, who do you think is behind it? You know, you've got a war going on over there. Uh, supposedly, that airstrike was on an ammo dump. And so I don't know if it was released because there was gas stored in the ammo dump or not, uh, that's plausible. I'm not saying that's what I think happened, but are I you're think more inclined to believe the position of of what Bashar al-Assad is saying and what the Russians are saying right now than more inclined to agree with believe what your even your colleagues here in the United States believe is truth that this is Assad and what human rights observers over there say is Assad. I don't think it would have served Assad's purposes to do a chemical attack on uh, on his people. So. I, you know, it's hard for me to understand why he would do that if he did. Congressman Tom Massey, thanks for your time.
And as you can see, Craig, the, the, the CNN reporter, she's gobsmacked, right? Oh, you know, are you, are you doubting your fellow congressman? Well, of course he is, because that system has no credibility whatsoever. So the real issue here that we're going to have to get to the bottom of over time is, you know, what was the source of this intelligence that Donald Trump was presented and who presented it to him that he fell for it hook, line and sinker, something that his own experience and his own observation of this war has taught him over a long time um, he shouldn't have. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the British government specifically in this. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing Britain has got its way in Syria. So here's the background, Craig. Donald Trump was elected on the 8th of November. And up until that election, everyone assumed Hillary Clinton would get elected. And Hillary Clinton um, was guaranteed to have escalated the regime change attack on Syria. Trump had campaigned against it every step of the way. When he got elected, there was huge shock. Just before then, the British government had doubled down on its rhetoric and, and propaganda about Syria and made all these wild accusations against Russia, accusing them of war crimes and, and um, entirely crazy stuff. And they were absolutely flabbergasted that Trump was elected. And they were offside with the stated foreign policy of the new president. And the Telegraph newspaper reported on the 13th of November at the last year, Mr. Johnson, that is Boris, is expected to fly to the United States within weeks to meet with senior figures in Mr. Trump's administration and make clear that Britain believes that Mr. Assad must go. Persuading Trump will be Britain's number one priority over the coming months. So in that time, you've had an intelligence onslaught on Trump, orchestrated by British intelligence. They, mm -hmm. the, all the original claims about Russian hacking all came from British intelligence. This onslaught, un unprecedented on an American president to drive, literally to drive him out of office. Tr people around Trump, like General Flynn, who was his choice as national security advisor, who was the first guy to blow the whistle on the fact that it was a US and British support for the rebels in Syria that created ISIS, right? He was a victim of this onslaught and he had to go. And so the people around Trump that had helped him formulate this anti-Syria regime change policy were being picked off, right? So that's what's happened in the meantime. The claims of this chemical weapons attack came from none other than the White Helmets. Now the White Helmets is a propaganda branch of Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. right? These, what, these people, they call themselves serious civil defence. They change their uniforms from these, these um, ones where they're with white helmets protecting civilians. Then they put on their jihadi clothes and take up guns and start shooting people. And they're supposed to be, you know, um, just purely civilian You never hear of defense. white helmets being taken hostage and beheaded, Robbie. You never hear of them being of course not. kidnapped. You never hear of them being put in any... Because they are Al-Qaeda. That's the point. Right? Um, they won the Oscar for the documentary about them and... Everyone was screaming, oh, Trump wouldn't let the leader of the White Helmets into the United States. Well, six months earlier, Obama wouldn't let him into the United States because of his connections to Al-Qaeda. And the biggest issue with the White Helmets is they're a creation of the British government. A former British SAS officer started them, and they're funded by the British government and the United States State Department, yep. right, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. They made this claim of a chemical weapons attack, um, it, that so much about the claim doesn't make sense. They claim that it was, you know, bombs dispersed in the air by bombers over all these people, yet there's only 70 victims, where there should be thousands of victims if that was the case. The Russians came back and said, look, there was a bombing. It was a bombing of a known chemical weapons lab. We were, the, 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 the Syrians were bombing a chemical weapons lab. If chemical weapons were released, it came from that, right? But that was completely discounted by the usual suspects, you know, right? And... Um, based on that intelligence, which somehow was presented to Trump in the most emotive way, right, he has um, made this decision. Now, the big issue, one, one final point I want to make is um, Glenn Greenwald is a very courageous journalist that he, he was the first journalist to report Edward Snowden's leaks on the National Security Agency, which, of course, those Snowden leaks showed this apparatus to be this total surveillance police state which is a, a, a joint US-American and British-Australian operation as well. We're part of it with the Five Eyes. Um, 
And the, the oppressive regimes we live under, we don't, we're not even aware of, and Snowden blew the whistle on that, but you needed a journalist to report it, and this guy, Glenn Greenwald, did. He tweeted yesterday this observation that the, pe the very same people who've been braying for Donald Trump's blood over his desire for better cooperation with Russia are going to fall in behind him if he, goes, if he yep. does something crazy on Syria. So look at this tweet that he um, pins, this guy Peter Dow. Peter Dow is a former Hillary Clinton campaign advisor. Um, and he says exactly what Greenwald says. You know, I, I oppose Donald Trump, but I fully support this action. And they're all going to do that, mm -hmm. right? And to show you un how unhinged this Peter Dow is, he, a few weeks earlier, he had tweeted this crazy rant about Russia, um, the, the, the supposed connections between Trump and Russia, where he says, if, there's, if the so-called Russian hacking of the US election influenced one vote, that would be the biggest political crisis in American history, yeah. right? That's how nuts these guys are. Yet they are the ones now cheering that Trump has done this, right? This is the war party. Um, you know, it was a question of how long Trump could resist them, and now this has happened. Craig, what should Trump really want to do if he wants to be genuine about solving something? Here? Well, Robbie, the, the issue comes back to it's not just the British government, it's actually the Crown. Now, we've written a lot about this, and we just put a press release out this week. Which is, why it's, multi, which is why it's successive British governments. They all it's, do it. Yeah, it's just because the British government, like you know, Tony Blair and so forth, is just acting on behalf of the Crown. Now, why do we say that? Well, go back and have a look at the prime funders and the prime movers for the whole international terrorist movement, it comes back to Prince Charles. We've said this many times, right? So what you have is an attack... We put out a big release this week to that effect And, well. and the principle is that there is an attack against Russia, and it's, you know, the British have been absolutely scathing against Russia because what, a, what does President Putin represent? He represents his principle of national sovereignty. So does China, and that's what the BRICS grouping of countries represents. You have, amongst a collapsing financial system, remember the global financial crisis has never been solved, the City of London is right in the middle of this, and the Crown is too, you have a collapsing financial system, but you also have the re-emergence of this principle of sovereignty, a complete repudiation of Tony Blair's regime change, which was the direction that Trump was going. Maybe he still is, we don't know. There's so much you know, unclarity here which will settle out in the next few days and weeks, I would say, that Russia was standing up for the sovereignty of Assad. They stand up for the sovereignty of all nations through the idea of the BRICS groupings of countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, that this attack by Trump is so serious. It's basically it's saying by Trump, we are free as the United States to violate someone else's sovereignty. Now, he's using the emotive arguments of what he's seen on television and so forth to justify it, but there is actually no justification. So this has changed, this will change the way that China looks at, again at the uh, United States. And again, you know, Putin hasn't come out and said, we don't know what Putin has said about this at this particular point of time, but this is what's the principle that's been under attack yeah. all the way along. And Craig, at a minimum, at a minimum for this kind of action, um, Trump should have got UN, US congressional approval? Well, that's the, prob the right. problem, Robbie, is that in, there was no UN approval for this, there's no US Congress approval for this. It's a unilateral action, and it could come back and really yeah. literally uh, create enormous problems for you. All him. right, so what we've done is very rough. It's, it's a breaking story, and we will keep on to it. And what you need to do, call in to the CEC to get a copy of our Australian Alert Service where we cover this type of material in depth. Um, and get it regularly if you can. Um, anyway, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we talk about a positive Glass-Steagall development. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, don't get buyer's remorse. Fight for Glass-Steagall banking separation. Um, Craig, the CEC has produced a new pamphlet called Australia Sleepwalking to Economic Armageddon, and I'll get you to talk about that in a minute, but just to report a positive development, overnight in the United States, the US Senate, or the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act was introduced into the US Senate by the same ones who sponsored it last time, um, Elizabeth Warren, John McCain, and Senators King and Cantwell. Um, it's the only good thing John McCain ever does, frankly, so we're happy at least he does something positive. What was most fascinating is in a discussion with those senators, the member of Donald Trump's team 
who was considered most likely to oppose Glass-Steagall because when Trump picked him, he was the president of Goldman Sachs. Mm. His name's Gary Cohn. He's now Trump's chief economic advisor. He said to these congressmen, he supports Glass-Steagall. He also wants to see the separation of commercial and, and investment banking come back. Yeah. Right, and no one expected this. And so, and what happens is you can see the look up the headlines on the internet if you want. Whenever someone associated with Trump speaks positive of Glass Steagall, it's reported everywhere because the banks are freaked out. Oh no, this could come back. Right, so we have to see. The contrast that though is um, this week, one of our CEC activists here in Australia, Sam Hansen, who's got form in this area. He, or yesterday, he confronted Australia's top banking regulator, who's the boss of APRA, Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, Wayne Byers, at an Australian Financial Review Forum, and he asked him about Glass-Steagall. So just have a look at Han Sam's question and Byers' answer. Uh, my name is Sam Hansen. I'm a university student from uh, Macquarie University. Um, although it all seems fine on the surface, I, I think it's undeniable that we're heading, the global international economy is heading towards another GFC 2.0 type of thing. Um, my, my question for you, Mr. Byers, is um, what would you say to public policy makers who would propose Glass-Steagall legislation as a means for mitigating the effects of such an event? Um, well, I'm not sure I agree with the inevitability. Um, the first, my first advice is always, uh, there's a whole range of reforms from the last financial crisis that haven't yet been implemented. It'd be good to finish doing that. Uh, before we think about other things. Look, Glass-Steagall, um, I know, is, is often thought of as something that would be a useful additional measure to take. Uh, and maybe it is in other jurisdictions. I'm not sure it's particularly relevant in Australia, and that's obviously my primary focus. Um, you know, the large, the large banks here, or even the, large, you know, the major banks in the next tier of banks, it's not as though they are big combinations of investment banks and commercial banks. There's still, the banking model here is still pretty much a conventional commercial banking, retail banking model. So Glass-Steagall, uh, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it because I think it may be something that others want to do, but it's not something we replicate here or see a need for here. So Craig, you see that buyers falls back, he's, he's only four back, he's, oh, 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 it really doesn't apply here. Give us, no, you know. That's what they all say. Yes, our banks are mixed, but they're such big commercial banks and such a little part of investment, bank, it really doesn't apply here. Well, that does not explain the derivatives danger that our banks have. Our flyer, this flyer that we've just produced though, Australia Sleepwalking to Economic Armageddon, does explain that and therefore why, it proves why Glass-Steagall applies to Australia. Yeah, Robbie, look, we have to, we've, there's been a lot of discussion in the media right now about this question of housing affordability, you know, the, and so forth. But behind this issue of housing affordability is the fact that the banks have got so much of their money tied up in housing that the entire thing is about to implode. Yeah. And there's been many, many warnings about that. So we've produced this flyer. One of the things that most people don't talk about is the fact that our banks are totally engorged by these things called derivatives, which are basically side bets. You know, in fact, they've got to the point now they don't even report these things. The because two biggest ones are hiding their derivatives. Effectively. So we've produced this flyer. It goes through the Australian housing bubble and all the, you know, the record housing bubble. It gives a solution of what Australia must do in terms of the Glass-Steagall. The three things, Glass-Steagall banking separation, separate out the merchant investment banks from the regular commercial bankings, create a stable banking system, then go with a national bank, create large amounts of credit for large-scale infrastructure development projects. So this pamphlet is available from the CEC, call in and get one now. And or actually get now. multiple copies, multiple get them out everywhere, we're mass printing this, but we've run out of time, thanks for tuning in and we'll do it again next week.